Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, no matter where you are. It's great to have you on this podcast today. Uh, today we are being, we're going to be talking about food healers, uh, what we need to do to address the food system that we have today. And I want to set it up with a small story. Because I, I heard about uh, Paul Chatlin a couple of years ago, and I contacted him and I talked to him. See, Paul Chatlin in 2013 had a big problem. He couldn't walk even 10 steps without feeling excruciating chest pain. So he went to his cardiologist who diagnosed that his heart was enlarged, his right side was thickened, and one of his major arteries was 100% blocked, and two others were 65% blocked. So he told Paul, you know, the only way out for you is one of two options. Either go on a plant-based vegan diet or undergo a triple bypass heart surgery. Now, Paul chose option A, you know, go on a plant-based vegan diet. So he took a month-long cooking course offered by uh, Dr. Caldwell and Anna Silstein, and he learned how to thrive on a healthy vegan diet. And it cost him $975 for the cooking classes. So then, you know, after he went vegan, his heart disease literally disappeared. I mean, as Dr. Esselstyn and others have been telling us for so long, you know, heart disease is just like, it's a food poisoning. It's just foodborne illness. And you can literally reverse it by changing your diet. So then you know, Paul tried to get his $975 reimbursed through Blue Cross Blue Shield, his insurance provider, and they refused. He escalated it all the way to headquarters, pointing out the absurdity that Blue Cross Blue Shield is willing to pay $125,000 for a triple bypass heart surgery, but wouldn't pay him $975 for cooking classes. And headquarters also rebuffed his claim, and they basically told him to go contact his legislature to make policy changes. Because you see, they had no code for cooking classes. They have pen plenty of codes for pills and procedures to maintain the disease, but no code for a cure. That is the healthcare system that we live in. And it's part of an economic game of endless growth, which monetizes everything so that when dead trees have more economic value than uh, live trees, we bulldoze all the trees. When dead animals have more economic value than live animals, we slaughter animals. When sick people have more economic value than healthy people, we sicken people. It endangers life on earth through climate change, biological annihilation, chemical pollution, and pandemics. It addicts everyone into compulsive behaviors in order to maximize corporate revenues and profits. It lies to us about the basics of nutrition, the root cause of climate change and pandemics, and the toxicity of industrial processes and products. And finally, it steals from the poor to enrich the rich. So when we buy a pound of organic rice in the supermarket for $2, it manages to trickle just five cents of it to the poor woman who grew that rice in India, leaving the rest for wealthy corporate donors, or uh, corporate traders. So this economic game is literally factory farming all of us by turning us into debt slaves and privileged prisoners. The privileged have to build walls around, to, around their houses to isolate themselves and succumbing to alcohol and drug, drug abuse. While the vast majority starve or slave at jobs to pay off their debts. So that's the game we are playing. And COVID-19 is just an overt manifestation of an ongoing public health crisis that has been going on for centuries because of the crummy food system that we have created to feed ourselves, right? I mean, our food system is so bad that we are actually extracting six times as much food as we really need from nature. And yet, even in the richest country in the world, America, 97% of people are not getting enough fiber in their diets. 98% of the people are not getting enough potassium in their diets. 
68% are not getting enough magnesium and so on. You know, right down the line, you can see malnourishment in the richest country in the world. The USDA has been putting out all these statistics, but doing nothing about it. The Food and Drug Administration and CDC are also doing nothing about it. Why? Because people are making money of our malnourishment. So that's where we are. And now that COVID-19 is exposing all these things, and, it's, and now you know, governors are telling people, stay home, close down all the restaurants, close down all the businesses, wear masks everywhere. And so all these mandates are coming from the governments. They have a duty to give us healthy food so that we can recover. We can recover our health, right? If they don't have a duty, if they're not going to do it, we are going to have to do it ourselves. And that's why I have um, these great guests today. Um, Jamin, Jamin Shively, who's doing this in Whitby Island, Washington. And then BJ Allen and Joya Wesley, who are doing this in Austin, Texas. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing what you're doing. It is really important that we show our governments you can't just mandate the closure of businesses and then tell people you fend for yourself. You know, we have to help people get back to their health, get back their good health. So first, uh, Jamin, tell us what you're doing in Whitby Island, Washington. Silas, great to see you. Um, so what we're doing on Whitby Island was inspired by you, Silas, and everyone here, all of us as a community, and what we're doing is we are setting out to create the iPhone of food, the iPhone of plant-based food. And if you allow me to screen share, I can show you a couple pictures of that. At some point, could be later, whenever's good for you. Um, here, let me let me just go ahead and give that a give that a go. Yeah, give it a shot and see if it happens. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Application window. All right. So uh, the, the whole idea is, and let me start up here. Okay. Can you I see that you okay, on, Yeah, I have you on the screen. Right. Okay, great. So you can see this, Food Healers of Whidbey Island. So our vision, which again, we've all been co-evolving, um, all of us, is that we deliver nutritious, wholesome, plant-based stew and bread or some other suitable carbohydrate, could be rice, um, but stew and some carbohydrate um, as the basis of just basic nutrition and do it in large quantities by large. If we buy large enough quantities of potatoes and lentils, lentils, you buy them at the store $2 a pound. If you buy them from the farmer, six and a half cents a pound, as we found. So the food can be enormously economical. We cook it at large scale using automation so that we don't spread COVID. We transport it using refrigerated trucks, the stew in this case. We've got the technology from milk trucks. But here's what I think the new face of the iPhone of food could look like. Look at that. A Tesla truck pulling an ultra modern trailer because we need to blast our way into the mind. And imagine on the side of that, it says food from the future, as if this thing got dropped by aliens. Again, we need to blast our way into the mind. We need to get the world's attention. Food for the future. You want to have a future? This is the food to eat. And everyone's going to wonder, what the heck is inside of there? The answer, 100% plant-based nutrition delivered to everyone. It's as simple as that. That is our vision of the iPhone of food. And the idea is we need to start somewhere. I think Whidbey Island would be a great place to start. What a story. Oh, my goodness, this space age food and da, da, da. And it's immune boosting and it's delivered to everyone's home. What's going on here? Has the United States suddenly gone communist? I thought we were going fascist. What's going on? Right. And so it becomes a story. It becomes a conversation. Well, they shouldn't be feeding everyone. Then all these, you just got all these lazy people having a bunch of babies. Right. And so it just creates this whole story, this whole dialogue. And that's what we want. Right. right. So that's the big vision. Create the iPhone of food. Make it something that just blows everyone away and then it'll spread, spread, spread. And then every community will want it because it's super economical. People will donate to it. It'll get people healthy. People won't have to leave their homes. 
you know, to go out and try to get food or get money or any weird stuff like that. Just sit back, relax. We got you covered. And what a feeling of unity this is going to create for the citizens of the world that finally right. we're taking care of each other. Anyway, I think I made my point. I'm going to go on mute, yeah. give the ladies a chance to talk. Thank you so much, everyone. Great to see you. No, all. before you go, Jamin, I, I want to ask you, in the state of Washington, um, are there restrictions because of COVID-19 these days on gathering oh, yeah. restaurants? Oh. And they're, they're, all the restaurants are closed for indoor dining. You know, okay. they're doing some outdoor stuff, um, but even that's dangerous. I mean, we need to stay at home. But and Governor J, Governor Jay Inslee, who also ran for president on the on the climate change is his major issue. Um, mm. he, he he's really getting aggressive as our governors across the nation. Yeah, I mean, I know they're getting aggressive about uh, mandates, but are they also getting aggressive about feeding people? No, it's absurd. That's the single thing we need to do. We're getting to this point of obviousness that this is what we need to do to protect our people. And it's super economical. We just need to show them how it's done. Yeah, thanks, Jamin. Uh, Joya and BJ, thank you so much for being here. And tell us what you're doing with the immune boosters and um, how is it going? Well, thank you, Dr. Rao, and good to see you, Jamin. Well, we also were inspired by the food healers. We love the idea of that, the, the big picture of letting people have food, but since it is available and so abundant. But mm -hmm. we wanted to start something local. We didn't want to wait. So we started a, a group that provides food from the farmer's market to some groups that cannot access the food banks right. and food pantries around. Um, I, I was inspired by the food healers, which meet on Friday. So the people are welcome to come join us uh, if they're interested in providing food. And then I met Joya and Joya helped put me in touch, us in touch with the, uh, the farmer that's helping us right now. We have uh, other people that help us. I want to give a shout out to them. Uh, Ann Allen, my mother, provides the car, and other people have offered to help deliver if I can. Mm -hmm. So we have growing, but it's it's very new. Joya, tell us more about your your thoughts on our group. Okay, yes, it is very new, and I, I thank you, Silas, for having me, and thank you, Jamin, for your inspiration, because um, BJ inspired me. I I am in the middle, or, or toward the end, I would say, of my own personal transformation and i have a story kind of like the mm -hmm. one you were telling earlier silas about your um the man whose people wouldn't pay the insurance wouldn't pay for the nutrition class right so i discovered i was i was delighted to see um dr mcdougall on the world convergence because he was a great inspiration right. to me too and it's kind of a funny story. I wasn't a, a climate healer or a food healer or even oriented in that way. I've always been kind of an activistly oriented person. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, we were on the Stanford campus at the same time. I have an undergraduate degree from there, 1988. So wow. we, may, okay. <laughs> we may have crossed paths at the Tresseter Union or maybe at a, a divestiture rally because I was a big <laughs> Or try to divest from South Africa, and I was involved right. with that. But I, my big story of my life basically had been my weight and my health. And I, I was, I was raised in Los Angeles by two overweight people from Alabama, which is mm -hmm. one of the heaviest states in the union with one of the saddest of sad diets, I think, in this country. And right. I grew up with that. And I wasn't, I wasn't a big meat eater. I, I, I've, I've never been an animal activist either. But mm -hmm. the last thing, I, I, so, so I was on this weight loss journey for decades, literal decades, and never really ultimately having success until I switched to a plant-based whole food vegan diet. Mm -hmm. and, I, I can't see anyone anymore. Did I do something? No, I, I we see you. We, I spotlighted you. Go for oh, it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, 
so what happened was I, I, I didn't even think my diet was very sad because I had been dieting for so long and had been studying and I ate a lot of vegetables. I was a big farmer's market fan in all the cities I lived in. I lived in Los Angeles recently and in um, North Carolina for a long time, Greensboro. But butter was the last thing I couldn't get rid of. The, the, um, I, I, I wasn't a dairy person because I was allergic to cheese. So butter was the last dairy product that I finally had to let go of. So, so I had had a little success. I had lost a little weight. I was doing better. I was on a plan that allowed butter. <laughs> I was very happy with that plan. And I was really uh, uh, addicted to the idea that I could be healthy and thin and still have butter. <laughs> so I had to, I let that go because I, after having a little success, I started sliding back and losing ground and gaining weight again and feeling sick again. And I actually had malignant hypertension. So I was mm -hmm. in a very dangerous place. So, um, I, I like to say that my my sad life, my standard American diet life, had a little had a grand finale and a little curtsy before it ended. So what happened was I I went crazy. I went my I was working as a um, artist manager and we had a big show, residency in North Carolina, which is a, mm -hmm. another one of those fat states in this union that likes fried food and meat and right. dairy and greasy animal based products. So the um, host took us to all the best restaurants in town and just made it a point that we eat, eat, eat. And I ate, ate, ate. And I was really, really off the straight and narrow, off the rails. Then we went to London and I ate a traditional English breakfast at the hotel buffet every morning for four days. So I was, I was in a mess, a mess. So I remembered, I went back through the 38 diets, I counted them up that I had actively tried over my life. And I remembered the rice diet, which was Dr. Mm -hmm. Walter Kempner, who Dr. McDougall gives credit to for being the father of plant-based nutrition or lifestyle medicine, I think. Mm -hmm. So he had a program at Duke University that was basically rice and fruit. And um, there's a one of his students or assistants, apprentices, recent, more recently wrote a book called The Rice Diet Solution, which has the same principles, which rice fruit. But the idea is that you take out all processed foods, all um, salt, and it resets your taste buds. So I knew I was in a bad way and I needed to reset my taste buds if I had any hope of ever getting back, not, not continuing my path to my 600 pound life, which is where I was going. I got to 339 was the highest, my top weight, but didn't get quite 600, but that's where I was headed because I was back on the wrong way. So while I was doing that, I thought I would do it for a couple of weeks just to get back straight. And then I discovered Dr. McDougall and I heard him say things like, we love good news about our bad habits and that butter news was a good news about my bad habits that I love, love, love. And I <laughs> had attached to him, was happy to hear. But I had taken a break from that. So I had, he was telling me good news about my temporarily good habits. So it was a new way of looking at it. And I wasn't as mad at him as I would have been <laughs> a month earlier to hear that and would have bristled and shut down and not followed that path at all. Right. So since I was already on it and already having great success, I'd already gotten off my blood pressure medicine. I had lost several pounds by the time I read that. I was like, oh, oh, OK, so this I could do this. I could keep doing this. I could eat six servings of starch and six servings of vegetables a day, basically three servings of fruit. And that's what the rice diet was. And that was a real simple way of putting it together. And that's how I continued putting it together. So vegetables is the key part of that. So. Um, the next part of the story, I feel like I'm going on and on. I'm, no, no, please. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. This life, I'm really impressed by the work you all have been doing and really glad to have been sucked into it by DJ, my new friend. <laughs> so this is a, a story of Zoom and, and I guess the story of the pandemic too, because Zoom has been a wonderful addition to my life and a lot of people's lives. 
and I was visiting our little river park. There's a river nearby here and met a nice man who is a member of BJ's church and he invited me to church in the middle of the pandemic, but it was Zoom church. They were having Zoom services until May. I think they had already decided way back then that they weren't going to gather in person as a small congregation. And I can let BJ tell you more about that because um, her this work, this immune builder's work, grew out of that too. That's an activist Unitarian mm -hmm. Universalist church. And I've I knew some Unitarian Universalists in Greensboro, and I liked them. So when I was invited, I was like, yeah, okay, I'd happily come to your church. Thank you so much for that invitation. So I did. And I had a background from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So mm -hmm. one of the other members said, oh, you Physicians Committee. And, and BJ said, oh, I live Physicians Committee plant-based too. I was like, oh, wow, that's exciting. And we live just eight miles apart in little towns in Texas. She's in Lockhart. I'm in a smaller town, Maxwell, that I ride my bike to. So, so I've also gotten off of that um, debt slavery treadmill in, in, a, mm. in a big way. So that's a kind of a corresponding train um, that I'm on. So <laughs> doing all that, my, my normal um, inclination would have been to just stay in my tiny house. I live in a tiny house and continue this work on myself that's still in in progress. But BJ said, oh, we're starting this and we need a farmer. And I was like, I got a farmer. And then, so I was like, okay, so we're doing this. We're doing it. This is happening. So it had a name, a cool name. She told me about the name. She told me about the food healers and the climate healers. And I loved the idea. And I thought, Vegetables really are the answer. And and coming from an right. African American standpoint, it's really like we're flogging ourselves with weapons that they gave us because because of these addictions to these foods. Right. And we can set ourselves free instantly. And it's just a matter of making that decision to eat a different diet. And then to learn that once you make that decision you're a part of the whole solution, the whole global solution. That feels really good and really exciting. So I'm I'm helping to distribute vegetables with BJ as part of the immune boosters while I continue mm -hmm. working on myself and continue learning about more of what what the climate healers is doing in more places where I can have an impact and um, be a be a be, a, be part of the change that I want to see, that we want to see. Thank you again. Awesome. Welcome home, Joya. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is so amazing, you know, because we are all coming home to who we really are. You know, that's the story we tell at Climate Healers. We are all coming home. We all have to free ourselves from this factory farm that we are in, you know, and those of us who have freed out and freed and who are looking and seeing the factory farm have a responsibility to help others free themselves. <laughs> so uh, that's the way I see. You know, I was in Ghana in, uh, I think, 2016. And uh, I saw, I mean, Ghana is so fertile, so beautiful that you throw a seed anywhere, you know, new trees are born and it's so fertile. So there are papaya trees, mango trees, all kinds of fruit trees everywhere. But people were not eating them because they were taught in school the, to eat according to the Western way, you know, I mean, with rice and milk. And <laughs> so people are running behind cars trying to sell me stuff in order to go and eat. You know, so it was crazy. You know, as you said, once you see the scales, when the, Take the scales off your eyes and you see what's going on um, you realize it's easy to free ourselves up you know it's easy to free ourselves from the bonds that we have been tied to and so, that fertility of the earth that you talked about right uh, should i let you speak first pj you had something to add oh well i just mine is on another track of how my eyes were open too i went to the doctor because my cholesterol was too high and he wanted mm. me to medicine. And eventually somebody gave me a book. And so my eyes were open to 
eating plant-based. And I tried to educate uh, teachers, share with what I knew, you know, not force any change. After school, I'd talk with teachers. So I've been on this journey for a while trying to share the news. And this seemed like a good way to do it, um, just to get some food out there. And Joya has beautiful ways of explaining these this abundance of food. I'll give it back to you, Joya. Okay, thank you. Yeah, abundance. That, I'm also working at a farm, an um, a organic vegetable farm, the farmer who's given us his surplus to distribute to the people who need it. And it's got kale and collards and broccoli and cabbage and squash and just the, it was an empty field when I first went out there. I met him at the farmer's market. And I told him, if you need somebody, I would like to, to do this. But I, I think I'm a farmer, maybe, let's see. <laughs> so we were checking it out but it was an empty field and he has several gardens around the area but this one was empty when we got there now it's beautiful with kale and all these plants and when he harvests to sell there's a lot of loss leaves that fall off that can be put together and made into bunches that can be good for people so i've been right. collecting and just just my mind just blown at how much and how continually the earth produces and gives and gives right. a bounty and people are not eating it in a lot even in here and texas even is not i wouldn't have thought of as a big fertile place but this ground is very fertile and it's producing so much beautiful produce and that i was inspired at the vegan world convergence too by um M M milani is that her name milani's um talk about gardening and community gardens so right. I think the future for for um immune boosters we can involve other gardeners and farmers because i know this this issue of surplus is is an issue for anyone who grows anything and it needs to be directed right. where it can heal people and expose people because that, that's the other thing is that there is the food bank here, and and BJ and I have been talking about this. There's alter there's options for people to get food, but not necessarily vegan food. And part of um, I, I think that the impact we're having in terms of the number of families we're getting vegetables to might be small, but in the future, I think we can do more education and promotion of the idea that vegetables are great, which is one of the comments you made yesterday, vegetables are great. And yeah, that's really the, the whole point. Right. They're heating, they're delicious, they're the answer, they've been here with us all along. Right. Now, the people that you give the food to, do they know what to do with the vegetables? Have you found out what they are doing with the vegetables? We don't know. We don't know. The first time I delivered individually to the individuals and um, I didn't speak their language and they were just grateful for mm -hmm. it. And the next time um, our group, this is a wonderful group called Mano Amiga, who helps immigrants in a number of ways. So mm -hmm. now they deliver the food, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know. And we have talked about uh, having recipes. Um, mm -hmm. We. I've thought about having little pictures of what to do with food because we don't know for sure what all the language will be. Most of them will be a Spanish related, but we don't right. know for sure. Um, we also want to, we've also thought about providing cooked food right. and how we could do that so that they see, oh, here's something delicious. Well, what's in it? Oh, that's the kale that y'all talk about. Right. Uh, most of them are very pleased that we've heard to get fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're still, we're still expanding. We've been doing this now for six weeks. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Six weeks. And I love the cooked food idea too. And Jamin, maybe we can have your recipe for your stew. Is it a regular, is it a, a, a set thing that's the, the same recipe or what? There's a, a unity stew and right. the, and the spices can change because, you know, <laughs> vegetables go so well together. And we're real fortunate that Dr. I think it was the Dr. Neil Barnard who looked over the recipe and said it has the nutrients that you need. I mean, it even has the, the juice from a lime and 
B12. So yeah, it can be all right. kinds of, go ahead, Jamin. <laughs> Oh yeah, I just wanted to add in terms of the vegetables. So here's a concept that can kind of uh, address all of these issues simultaneously, including the spoilage of fresh vegetables. Obviously the, the nutritional value of vegetables declines rapidly with heat or anything like that. So imagine, this is just a concept. So you're, you're there in a part of Texas where there's a large Latino uh, population. I happen to be Hispanic myself. So imagine we created a stew for that community that was kind of Latin based, you know, with, you know, with your corn and your beans and spices and all that. So imagine you cook the, you cook the rice, you cook the beans, you cook what needs to be cooked. And now just imagine we then chop up the vegetables. We get them fresh from the source, chop, 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 mix them in the stew cold cold and you refrigerate the whole thing down to close to zero degrees centigrade but not freezing because we still want it to be liquid when it's cold like that it's got all this let's just call it thermal inertia it's cold and because there's a lot of water and a lot of stuff as long as you put it in a pot and it's not exposed to the sun it's going to stay cold you can even transport it for hours it'll stay cold so you don't need refrigeration the vegetables as soon as they were fresh from the farm chop 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 boom they're in a cold bath so they're, the, the nutrients are in suspended animation and <laughs> then it can all mix and marinate and all that. You bring the cold stew and you say, listen, all you gotta do is heat it up. And it's like, woo, mama mia, this is my kind of stew. And then that way it's just like, it's, a, it's just problem solved. That's why I call this the iPhone of food. You don't have to teach anyone how to sh cook or this or that or, or farmer, you know, just here, here's the food. Now, of course, long-term, we wanna get everyone growing their own food uh, as much as possible so that the produce is very local, fresh, et cetera, et cetera. But the first thing we got to do is feed everybody. And this gets, this, this is, isn't just about environment and it's not just about nutrition. It's also about atonement, which is something that we keep running into over and over and over. We need to atone for mm -hmm. our harms that we've caused to our brothers and sisters, as well as to our mother, mother earth. And so, um, the, the first part of atonement, look, it's, it's, it's great to look back and say, okay, what do we do to atone for that that happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago, what have you? But the first step in atonement is very simple. Stop the harm. Right. Stop the ongoing harm right now. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like I'm some pyromaniac. When I'm going around setting houses on fire and I'm talking to my priest and saying, hey, you know, how do I atone for all those houses I burned down 10 years ago? Step number one, Jamin, stop setting houses on fire. Stop the harm. <laughs> then we can go back. But right. right now, put down the matches. For us, putting down the matches is feeding our sisters and brothers, period, full stop. Oh, so, thank you for the training. Go ahead, Joya. Yeah, thank you. Where, where do you... Where so when you say everybody, you're in the milk trucks. You're so it's just you do to pull up to populated places and open it up and start passing it out. Yeah, okay. yeah. That, that, that's the idea. We we kind of have this vision of like in the case of the stew, we pull up and the message is bring your own container. Got a big family? Bring big pots. We'll fill you up. Eat what you need now. Put the rest in the refrigerator. Perfect. Right. Yeah. And th that's exactly it. And and so, and zero packaging, bring your own container. So we've got big reusable pots, whatever bins, we'll, we'll figure out the technology, the details, but we just deliver you the food. You don't have to leave your home. I mean, walk outside, obviously come to the curb and, you know, safe social distancing and all that. It'll be just safe to the max, but feed nice. everyone. And, um, you know, we, we live on an island where there's, you know, a lot of wealthy folks and frankly, not a lot of hunger or malnourishment other than the traditional Americana malnourishment from eating the wrong foods. Um, but I think this is the place where we can be successful because it'll get everyone's attention. And then the wealthy people can say, OK, finally, an efficient form of feeding everyone that I can support. Here's my checkbook. Go, go, go. And then we expand to Seattle and Portland and all up and down the West Coast and let this become a phenomenon that catches fire and goes all over the world. That's yeah. the big vision. You know, one of the things is that the wealthy, the wealthy people also need to understand that 97% of Americans don't get enough fiber in their diet. And they're probably part of that too, okay? 
very few people who are out of it. 98% are not getting enough potassium in their food. So Americans are malnourished. This is why the obesity rates are so high, because our body is saying, you haven't eaten enough. Where is my nutrient, right? So making us eat more and more when we, and we're eating all this junk. So this is a part of the problem, right? So they need to realize that it's also solving a problem for them, for the rich people too. You know, it's not just for poor people. We are all in this together. Yeah. We are, and I want to say we keep coming across other groups that are also concerned about the poor and having uh, providing food for them. So we're trying to find out ways to work right. with them. Um, have a, a large homeless population in Austin uh, living under bridges. And uh, my friend Renee Kimball and I, we have delivered food from the back of her truck to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, on certain days, they've already been fed. So we're, we're pleased that some groups are working so hard to, to feed people, but there are many that are just missing out. And, and more and more will be missing out because of the coronavirus and the loss of jobs, as you know. Right. Yeah, coronavirus is basically resetting the whole game, the economic game of growth and saying, think about what we are doing. Right. So we have been we have been sort of mindlessly playing along with that game for so long. And now that so many people are out of jobs, we have to think about the game we are playing and say, you know, should we really be playing the same game or should we be changing that game, especially when they, they're telling us, Put masks on your face, you know, don't go talk to your relatives. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm making all these sacrifices and you're not even telling us the truth about what is going on, not even changing the game. You know, so that's unacceptable. And this is why I think Governor Jay Inslee and people like that should be stepping forward and saying, how can we help? Right? Because they are supposed to be progressive governors who are mandating all these closures. And they're not helping the people? Excuse me. There's something wrong. Right? Um, go ahead, Jamin. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, they, they lack the imagination. Uh, people who go into politics in general, right, aren't people like us. They're people, anyway, I, I don't want to badmouth all politicians or mm -hmm. anything like that. But the, the bottom line is very simple. We need to show them the way. Once we show them the way, once they see that first Tesla truck hauling this ultra modern trailer saying food for the future, what, what, what? Everyone will find out about it. They'll do the math. Wait a second. So you're delivering stew at 25 cents a serving and it's delicious and neutral. What's going on here? Well, we've turned economics on its head. See all those distribution centers, see all those Costco's, see all those supermarkets, Trader Joe's, this, that's all gone. We're going from the farm to your plate. Boom, zero packaging, zero BS, and zero cruelty. And and then when people see it, it's it will it will beckon to be replicated. And then people say, well, that's great. And people in Austin will say, hey, let's do that. Let's do it. And so it take it's going to take a little bit of concentration of focus mm -hmm. at one place. And I have no attachment to where that place is. If it's Texas, it's Texas. If it's Phoenix, it's Phoenix. If it's Whidbey Island, it's Whidbey Island. But let's get that first Tesla truck and that first shiny metallic trailer that looks like it came from a spacecraft. <laughs> right. And let's blast our way into the minds, hearts and imaginations of our fellow human beings and show them a new way. And then it'll spread like wildfire. Yeah. You know, it'll be good to involve uh, doctors as well so they can test people and see and show them what their nutrient deficiencies are in the beginning and what it is at the end. You know, I have to go through maybe a 21 day program on this. Uh, and um, sh show them the results, right? So I, I was talking to this Dr. Gross, um, and he found this amazing way to get people to, to go plant-based. Uh, he has 80% of his people, of his patients, are, have gone plant-based, he said, because he makes them watch What the Health, and then he gives them a questionnaire to watch with the What the Health. So he says, fill up the questionnaire as you're watching. And so because they want to answer the questions correctly, people watch it intently. <laughs> and when they watch it intently, they realize they have been fooled all along, that they have been lied to, and they are being farmed and used as objects for pharma companies to make money off of them. So people get very upset and they say, okay, you know, uh, I don't want to be part of that anymore. 
That's so, wonderful, Dr. Rao. Uh, it just reminds me if people want to watch that and have a discussion, that's one of the other things that climate healers will do. We'll share a video together in a group of, of your choice. And we may be able to get a doctor there with, uh, with us to answer questions, but we'll watch that together. And that's through climate healers. Yeah. Uh, so join, I mean, BJ has the climate healers group in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, we are basically you know, um, producing these documentaries to help educate people as to what is really going on and open their eyes so that they can say, I can free myself you know, by doing this instead of that. Of course, some people need help. And so we need to help them when they need help, uh, which is what Jamin is talking about. I mean, Jamin is talking about literally reinventing our economic game on a foundation of healthy immune boosting food because right now our economic game is built on a foundation of extraction and accumulation you know and so it's like a ponzi scheme right and the, the people who started the ponzi scheme are getting richer and richer and richer right <laughs> and they're saying oh key you came in late sorry you know <laughs> yeah right. so but at some point you know we have to realize that we are the ones providing the resources for that game <laughs> and so we can say hey i'm not playing that anymore you know and we can play something else right <laughs> especially stop buying those things that are so unhealthy and cause so much damage and destruction um we have a mayor in marshall texas well, it was a few years ago. I hope he's still there. But he started a festival of eating plant-based foods and he would have guests come in. It was a festival for a few years. I don't know if he's still there, but uh, there are some people who are making a difference. And boy, that town might be a town to check and see. Did you notice the difference, you know, right. in, in the number of people and how their health was? It'd be good to get some baseline numbers there. Yeah. Go ahead, Jamin. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, BJ. And listen, uh, let's 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 expand from individual health to community health. Okay, can you imagine? Just literally, just close your eyes for a half a second and just imagine a world in which people provide food for everyone. And you you wake up in the morning. Oh, there's the food truck. Okay, yeah, let me get the pots. Da, da, da. Hey, thanks so much. Great to see you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Suddenly, humanity is working as a community. Little kids w wake up and grow up in a world in which people take care of each other. No, this is what we do. You need food. We, here's food, 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 food. We just, this is what we do. Our daily work is make sure everyone has enough to eat. Then if we want to relax, we can relax. Or if we want to then go the next step and say, okay, how do we get health care for everyone? How do we make sure everyone has good shelter and clean towels and running water and all this good stuff? But the first thing is food. That will be the single most transformational thing we can do in the history of the planet. It's the single healthiest thing we can do for the individual, for the community, and for the world. I mean, it's just win, 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 win. There's zero downside. The only downside is for the capitalists who say, wait a second, I want people to keep coming to, you know, to, to Whole Foods and buy triple wrapped plastic single use whatever for 30 bucks an ounce. No, 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 no. Food is inherently, Mother Earth is inherently generous. We just need to avail ourselves of her generosity and share the love. This is going to be a revolution of the heart, a revolution of community, a revolution of culture. It's going to be the era of sharing. We're going to go from the era of hoarding to the era of sharing. It's going to be beautiful. Go ahead, Joya. I just, I just want to give a, um, a shout out for Whole Foods because I, I, not, I know I understand what you're saying and all that rap stuff is, is one thing. But the idea that it's expensive and difficult to go vegan, that's the other thing, the word vegan. Maybe I can get some of you more experienced people to right. talk about that because it's a new identity for me, <laughs> which is a trip. It's been a trip in my relationships and my family and my mind and mm -hmm. I'm still integrating all of that. But when I started and I, I was kind of displaced from Los Angeles, I left because of COVID and the, the, my work was over. So I needed to scale back and I was living with my sister in Mobile, Alabama and they have a Whole Foods there, I'm happy to say. And I was able to go there and get bulk beans and rice and large bags of organic apples and bunches of organic vegetables for 
way cheaper than what I would have been paying if I was eating my old standard American diet, which was not the cheap standard American <laughs> diet. I was eating on a right. higher level, so I would have been buying the triple wrap, thirty dollar ounce stuff at Whole Foods. <laughs> but now I was just buying the um, the vegetables and the bulk, right? Grains and beans, and that can be very affordable. And I think people need to know right. that. And I like to get that message out to people that it doesn't have to cost a lot, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be as simple as beans and rice. It does not get much more simple than that. And yeah, that's the crux of what I eat now, and with the vegetables. So that that message I think is important because people are part of the capitalist game. That that whole scheme is to keep people confused. Oh no, you can't do that. You won't get right. the protein. It's too hard. It's don't don't right. even bother. You can't go anywhere. Right. You can't go anywhere. And I I don't eat out anymore basically because basically you can because there are all the big food delivery systems, the big Cisco's, and they're they have the, all the same pre prepared oil slicked salted sugared items that are basically repackaged in restaurants all across the country, the same food right. that's not serving the planet, being eaten in different ways. Thank you for bringing that up, Joya. You're absolutely right. You know, this is one of the reasons why we did the Unity's 2 recipe, just to cost it out and show people that per serving, it costs 50 cents. And it's full of vegetables and grains and beans all put together, it costs 50 cents you know, to make it. So it's cheaper than what you can get at McDonald's, you know, and um, yeah, go ahead, Jamin. Oh, no, no, I was just giving you a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. And, um, no, no, but, but the efficiency part of it is a huge part of the story. This doesn't have to cost. And when people see how efficient it is, I can donate a thousand bucks and that'll provide 2000 meals. That gets donors excited. They like to see their dollar get some mileage out there, right? right? And um, I mean, I, I remember one time, uh, you know, some homeless young man looked plenty strong, was like, hey, man, can you give me some money? I want to get a hotel for the night. And I'm thinking, wait a second here, the efficiency of that. I'm supposed to give you a hundred bucks. You can get a hotel room for, no, no, no. But a hundred bucks feeds 200 people. Now you got my attention, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we just got to do this. We just yeah. got to do it. Yeah, I also want to end with a story that I learned about this um, a few years ago, uh, that in India, back in the 17th, 18th century, um, people didn't pay for food. Food was always available. It was plenty because it's growing everywhere. So people hardly ever, no one really paid for food. So they were just, you know, they went hungry either. So... There was so much food that famines happened once every hundred years or so. It's very rare to get a famine in India, okay? But then the British were colonizing India at that time and they were getting bigger and bigger and they were trying to get the Indians to help build ships for them because the French were sinking all their ships, right? So there was a war going on. So they said, you know, they were trying to get the Indians to help build ships and no one would come to work because they were saying, hey, I have enough food. Why do I have to do your stuff? especially chopping down trees, forget it. <laughs> I don't want to do that job, right? So the British figured out that to make people work, they had to make them hungry. So the way to do that was to tax Indians in a particular grain. So they would tax people in the South in rice, people in the North with wheat. So they would say, you know, each village has to give us 150 bushels or whatever it is, right? So. Every village had to just grow rice in order to feed this tax man <laughs> who was demanding this, right? So people now had to create monocultures, grow monocultures. And when you grow monocultures, you depend on someone else to give you the other stuff to eat. So you create a market. So now suddenly, you know, famines were happening once every 10 years and people were going hungry. And they had plenty of workers to go build their ships so that they go fight their wars with the British, French, right? So it's this idea of war, colonialism is all built into this food system. Okay, And this is what's imprisoning us. This is what's keeping us stuck in this fight, right? So it's going back to basics. If you look at why were Indians so you know, eating um, 
properly and were healthy and they they really didn't didn't have to go work for the british because the base food in india is vegan the base food is always rice and lentils and then you add vegetables and things on top of that right so if they add uh, animal foods it's like a it's small bit that you add on top of that rice and beans and so the base food is always vegan and to that they were adding some butter or something at the end right if the rich people would do that so fundamentally it was vegan food to start with right whereas the culture here the fundamentally it's animal food to start with and so it's difficult for people in america to make that switch but in india it's easy to make the switch to veganism really i really believe that indians will become go vegan first <laughs> if they put their minds to it it's easy for us for us to do it and i'm sure lots of countries in africa are like that too you know the base food is vegan for indigenous cultures so what what do we do i'd like to hear from you guys to to help people on a broader scale with the um addiction it's the food addiction that makes it impossible for a lot of people to hear this right. message i didn't hear it it was like my ears were clogged with butter <laughs> so if anyone talked to me about anything that involved no butter i couldn't hear it anymore and goodbye right. <laughs> that's the end of this conversation so right. I, and now when i'm trying to talk to people i i don't have words that i think people who are like me last year or <laughs> today can hear and can really even wrap their minds around and, right I I feel like the, the 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 best success I have personally so far is starting with the personal and community health route right. but that doesn't always work and I think the addiction makes it impossible for people a lot of people to even begin to hear so it's like that has to be attacked in some way first Go ahead Jamin Yeah well one one thing that I love that I think is relevant for this is very simple. Why tell them when you can show them? And why show them when you can just put the fruit in front of them? Listen, if we're delivering this stew all over the place and it's this big story, what is this food for the future? Food from the future. 100%. Oh, what well, well, at some point you say, "Okay, well, you know what? Let, let me try this. Let me put down my barbecue <laughs> drumstick and let me just give this a try." And see now this is where we need to bring in the award winning vegan right. chefs. I mean and, and when I say iPhone I'm not kidding. I'm not saying oh let's do some crappy little flip phone of food that kind of breaks out after a couple of years and then you get some other piece of crap and you go from crap to crap. No, let's once and for all solve it. And if we do the iPhone of food, delicious, free, delivered right to your home, zero packaging, zero waste. It comes in a space age Tesla truck. They'll probably come out just to see the dang Tesla truck. <laughs> and then they'll say, well, yeah, I happen to be hungry. Yeah, yeah, give me something. I'll give it a try. What the heck, right? The worst thing I can do is I spit it out. But it's going to be so delicious. They're going to say, wait, wait a second here. This tastes good. This tastes hearty. W w there's got to be chicken in this. There's got to be chicken in this. <laughs> right? No, no, no. And that, that their taste buds will win them over. It, women throughout the world know the key to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> Let's put food in their stomach that they'll make them smile. It's as simple as that. We've got to do it. And we got to concentrate in one place. Again, I don't care where, but we got to start. Right. So let's stand together, pool our resources and make this happen. Go ahead. Yeah, Damon, I mean, I'm with you, you know, 100%. And I I think that uh, uh you were right. I mean, the, the idea behind this food truck is is to bring the community together. So the community the best way to overcome addictions is with a community okay when so people tend to do things together very much better than doing things by themselves you know um i know jamen had trouble overcoming his cheese addiction you know <laughs> and i had trouble overcoming my yogurt addiction so we all have our little things right and, and i mean i had to uh, i had to sort of create yogurt out of soy milk and then i said oh i can do this now you know because now i have soy yogurt that tastes just as good it's not better than uh, than milk yogurt so yeah we we all have uh, our little things that we stick to that keeps us stuck in the in the factory farm so it's about helping us overcome that and 
in getting out of it but yeah we are we are in this we are in this together and uh, we are this is heading towards a vegan world by 2026 that's how fast we need to do this and let's do this right and, and i think the food system is the is the basis of it yes i think people will be also inspired to grow their own where they mm -hmm. can oh that's all it takes well we can oh gosh i'll help you start a garden or there's a community garden or as uh, the sadhana forest do they go to a family and say would you like us to help you show how show you how to plant trees and you can take care of them and then they go to another family if they don't want to okay but if if there's so then you start growing your own and becoming independent and growing forests and there's it's all so connected it's all so connected absolutely absolutely thank you so um we have just a few minutes left Do you have any parting thoughts, Jamin? Go for it. Well, I think it's going to be like that story, Stone Soup. So when the community saw that these three weary soldiers were coming together and working hard to feed everyone, even though it started with just a story, everyone then started contributing. So if we start with one Tesla truck and one space age trailer and get everyone's attention, and then they're going to say, "Well, wow, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. What can we do? Well, grow produce. That's all. Just grow produce." and contribute it. That's all. We're going to feed you regardless whether you grow or don't grow. But once people start feeling that generosity, you cannot help but get sucked into it in a very good way and say I'm in, I love this. Wow. It's going to change everything. We just got to start. Yeah. Joya, any parting thoughts? You know, we're we're starting. We're rolling. We're we're doing our little bit of immune boosting in our corner of the world and we'll be ready with the uh we'll we'll have built up some momentum some more momentum i think yeah here from us so absolutely yeah bj i think i'm just feeling very grateful to find other people with a vision to move forward in in solving some of our biggest problems and uh the zoom has helped and i think i think the community members of my church and the local people and then all around the world who who want to help and and be a part of this great transformation thank you with that you have the last word bj thank you very much for for being here and thank you all for being here and uh next week we will be talking to ian mcfallen who couldn't come this week but he's coming next week and we're going to talk about what we're doing in south africa as part of food healers so stay tuned thank you all